Hello, I'm Father Anthony Chicada. One disputed question in traditionalist circles, particularly among Sede Vacantists, concerns the 1955 Holy Week reforms of Pope Pius XII. On one side are priests like myself, who maintain that these reforms paved the way for the 1969 New Order of Mass of Paul VI and were the work of the same sneaky modernist cabal that concocted the post-Vatican II reforms. For these reasons, we don't believe that we're bound by them, so we use the pre-1955 Holy Week and Missal. On the other side are priests and laymen who say, whoa, Pius XII was a true pope. You can't ignore his liturgical laws. You're obliged to follow them no matter what. Otherwise, you're rejecting Pius XII's authority. I've addressed this objection in several articles. Liturgical laws that were objectively good and obligatory when they were promulgated, I've shown, are like any other ecclesiastical law. They can become harmful and cease to bind years later due to changed circumstances. This is a general principle all canonists recognize because a human legislator, even a pope, cannot foresee all possible future situations. But some priests just keep rattling on about disobedience and pretend the principle doesn't exist even though they in fact apply it to many laws themselves. All of them, for instance, will celebrate the traditional mass outside sacred places, in rented rooms or private homes, on portable altar stones. But these practices clearly violate liturgical laws promulgated by the Council of Trent, Pope Benedict XIV, Pope Pius VII, and Pope St. Pius X. So, do I accuse them of rejecting laws promulgated by a legitimate pope, or acting in defiance of the orders of Trent, Benedict XIV, Pius VII, and Pius X? Not at all. These priests recognize that slavishly following these laws in the post-Vatican II wasteland would not only create grave inconveniences, but also harm, if not render impossible, large parts of their apostolate. Thus they acknowledge the general principle that I merely apply to the Holy Week reforms. So come on, fathers, give me a break. But that said, one St. Patrick's Day, I was mulling over my Pius XII Holy Week file, and I wondered aloud, what would Pope Pius XII tell me to do? He was the legislator after all, I wish I could go back, present him with the evidence, and ask him if I'd still be bound by it all. Well, sure enough, it being St. Paddy's Day, a contingent of leprechauns bearing green cupcakes and a time travel pistol arrived at my office door to grant my wish. We've heard your reverence would like to take his case to the angelic pastor himself, one of them said as they presented the cupcakes. So here you go, he said, aiming his time travel pistol at me. Back to 1957 with you, to his holiness's own office, and mind your P's and Q's with Mother Pascolina. Suddenly, there I was, before the austere and dignified, but somewhat surprised, figure of Pius XII. Mamma mia, de dove vieni, he said. From America, your holiness. Ever the suave diplomat, the pontiff maintained his composure, even after I explained I'd arrived from the year 2018 by time machine. Another American gadget, he opined. But since Cardinal Spellman will be arriving for his St. Patrick's Day visit in a few minutes, we can practice our English with you. I'm most grateful. Could I then ask your holiness a few questions about the Holy Week reforms you just promulgated in 1955? It seems that they eventually led to a few problems in the liturgy 
that your holiness didn't foresee. Such as? Well, the men who worked on them had a secret agenda. It's all in my file here. As the years went by, they used your reforms to justify more and more radical changes in the Mass. Fifteen years later, by 1969, Latin was abolished, altars were replaced with bare tables, tabernacles were removed from the sanctuary, transubstantiation was no longer mentioned, women served as lectors. Impossible. Our successor, His Eminence Cardinal Siri, would never have permitted it. Uh, actually, your successor was Roncalli, but he had modernists written on his holy office file. Even worse, Your Holiness, he called a council, and he let the theologians you condemned in Humani Generis write its decrees. Disaster. But surely, at least the experts who were in charge of my Holy Week reforms were solid men. Like that smart young Vincentian, what's his name, Father Bugnini. Alas, Your Holiness, in 1975, Bugnini was unmasked as a mason. This explains why he wrote that the process of liturgical change during your reign would, quote, require the enlightened collaboration of all the active forces, unquote. E vero? Massone? Well, then the brilliant Father Jungmann. We have his book right here on our desk. He was part of the conspiracy, too. Here are notes from a secret meeting in 1948 when Father Jungmann offered what he called his heart's dream for future changes in the Mass. The vernacular, reducing genuflections, de-emphasizing the consecration, changing the offertory, shortening the canon, eliminating some saints from the canon. All behind closed doors? But even when we were sick, we had the help of our staff when we approved the reforms. Our confessor, Father Bea, was another scholar. If you take a look at Bugnini's memoirs here, Your Holiness, uh, you will see how Bugnini boasts that Father Bea was a fellow conspirator who helped get your approval during your illness. And Bea did even worse later. Working with Rabbi Heschel and the B'nai B'rith Lodge, he got Roncalli's counsel to declare that the Jews had no guilt for the death of Christ. But no. Well, Monsignor Montini also urged us to approve the reforms. Bugnini also named him as part of the conspiracy. Well, we did have some worries about Montini. They were more than justified, Your Holiness. If you look at this photo, ah, he became a Lutheran and celebrated the Lord's Supper. I knew it! No, even worse. The 1963 conclave elected him pope to succeed Roncalli. These pictures show what he changed the Mass to in 1969 aided by the mason Bugnini and a whole modernist cabal, and even this group of Protestants. He also permitted lay people to receive communion in the hand. And here's what papal low mass looks like in the Vatican in 2018. Horribile. But what do the later sacrileges of Montini have to do with our Holy Week reforms? When he promulgated his new Mass in 1969, Your Holiness, Montini stated that your Holy Week reforms were the first step towards the adaptation of the Roman Missal to the sensitivities of this new age. He associated us with this? Our reforms were the first step? We had no idea. But... You are not saying that our own reforms were evil in themselves, are you? Of course not, Your Holiness. But for us to continue to use your Holy Week after what Paul VI did to the Mass gives a false legitimacy to his later reform. Ah, il naso del camello, eh? The camel's nose in the tent. Capiamo. We understand. People ask, if you take the nose, why not take the whole camel? Exactly. But since Your Holiness was the legislator for the Holy Week reforms, I would like to ask whether, knowing all this, you would say that 50 years later, 
we would still be legally bound to follow the changes and give credence to the sacrilege that was the conspirators' goal? Absolutely not. But if you have read Moroto, Coronata, or Cochi's canon law manuals, you would already know about the principles of epicaea and cessation of law, so you wouldn't need an American time travel machine to come back and ask us about it. True enough, Your Holiness, but some people wouldn't even take Cardinal Cicignani's word for it. By the way, is your parakeet whistling an Irish jig? He's signaling us that Cardinal Spellman has arrived. Now, what is that Irish greeting that we are supposed to give His Eminence? Top of the morning to you. Ah, yes, Father, and the rest of the day for yourself. I started to disintegrate. Cardinal Spellman entered, and I quickly shouted, Holy Father, set him straight on religious liberty. But it was too late. There I was in my office again. The leprechauns cheered and presented me with another round of green cupcakes. To conclude, if the supreme legislator Pius XII knew all we know about what the reformers were really up to, do you think our little scenario would still be that far-fetched? But we do have the facts before us. Bugnini, the great architect of the liturgical revolution, told us that the Pius XII reforms were a bridge between the old and the new that led to a new city. And we do have the canonical principle to apply, a church law that through changed circumstances becomes harmful, ceases to bind, a principle that even our critics repeatedly apply themselves. If you think that the last missile of the last true pope should be the last word on the form of the liturgy you want to last forever, fine, and you're welcome to it. But as far as I'm concerned, if you're telling people they should never, ever go to the new city, why insist we're still obliged to walk halfway across the bridge anyway? It doesn't make any sense. Thank you.